For those of you who consider yourselves to be familiar and well-versed with PC hardware, this video will probably leave you understimulated. But if you've never built a computer before, this will help you get turned on. If you're not sure how to pick the parts for your computer, you can check out the card up top, but if you've already got your components out on the table and ready to go, it's time to take the gloves off. Or put them on, I guess depending on whether or not you're working with glossy surfaces or tempered glass. Some useful tools to have around are a magnetic screwdriver kit, a magnetic tray to prevent the loss of screws, thermal paste if there is none included with your cooler, an anti-static wrist strap that you should definitely always be wearing all the time forever, and optionally, an anti-static mat. If you don't have one of those, your motherboard box will do just fine. Be careful though, those motherboard boxes can be quite sharp. It hurts more than going from ultra to high settings sometimes. We'll be putting together a fairly budget build targeting 1080p gaming at or around 60fps. It's not THE most budget build, but it's what I could find at Micro Center for really cheap, plus some stuff I had lying around, and then something generously provided by FSP. So that's what I'm rolling with. We're using the Ryzen 5 1400 processor, the ASRock B350M Pro 4 Micro ATX motherboard, 16GB of Crucial Ballistics RAM, an EVGA GTX 1050Ti graphics card, an SSD that should be left somewhere in the basement, the completely modular small form factor dagger 600 watt power supply from FSP, and the Inwin 301 case that I'll be doing a formal review on in the future. After you've got your boxes opened, the first thing you should do is install your motherboard's IO shield into the opening in the back of your case. You will probably lose it otherwise, or just forget and not realize until you're done building and then at that point you might as well just throw everything in the trash. The openings for the audio ports on the IO shield are usually towards the bottom, and the side that has some padding or little middle tabs points towards the inside of the case. The IO shield pops in from the inside of the chassis and can be a little stubborn sometimes, so it may take some force to get it to cooperate. But once it's in, you'll definitely probably know. That hits a little closer to home than I'd like to admit. After this, put your anti-static wrist strap on and clip it to something large and metal, like your power supply fan grill or your case. Get your motherboard and place it on top of your anti-static mat or the box. Open up the retention bracket or arm and grab your processor. Line up the marker on the processor with the marker on the socket or the bracket and gingerly insert your member. It should require no force aside from gravity and sit comfortably in place. You can give it a wiggle to confirm that it's in right, then lower the retention system back. If you're on an Intel socket, your motherboard should have come with a socket cover. This will pop right off when you lower the retention bracket down to secure the chip in place. After that, go ahead and install your RAM. The RAM only fits one way, so check to make sure the notch in the module lines up with the slot. If you're not populating all slots, you'll want to check which ones need to be filled first. Your motherboard manual will always tell you which to refer to, but in many cases, not this one, the non-black slots should be the priority. Make sure the clips on the dim slots are unclipped, insert the module, then press down on both sides. Most of the time, the clips will click back in place, but sometimes they go quietly, so you'll want to check to see if it's gone back to its locked position. If you're installing an M.2 drive, slot it into the M.2 port and hold it down with the itty bitty screw that comes with your motherboard. The rest of this video can be done in a number of ways, depending on what's easier for you. If your cooler is smaller, you can go ahead and install that now. There's almost always a manual provided if you get stuck. If you have a larger cooler, you may want to wait until afterwards, assuming your case has a cutout on the motherboard tray if you need to access the back as you may have some issues with plugging in cables later. As for preparing the case for insertion, you can choose to install the power supply and pre-route the cables, or wait since moving the case around with it may not be so easy. Optionally, it's not a terrible idea to install your cooler and graphics card while the motherboard is still outside of the case, connected to a power supply and monitor, then bridge the positive and negative power pins with a screwdriver head to see if all the components work. Some motherboards have a power button, but bridging the pins makes you feel way cooler. Ignoring that optional step completely, I'm going to install the stock heatsink that came with the Ryzen 1400 now. If you're using an aftermarket cooler like a beefy heatsink or an AIO, be sure to follow the directions provided and check for and remove a plastic film on the contact plate if there is no pre-applied thermal paste. If no such pre-applied thermal goop exists, you'll need to apply your own. For a chip of this size, we can use an amount equal to about the size of a pea. But if you've got a bigger chip, you can be a little more liberal. If you want to replace the stock thermal compound or if you mess up, you can clean the chip and the heatsink with isopropyl alcohol and paper towel or coffee filters or a microfiber cloth or whatever. To install our stock heatsink, we'll first need to remove these two brackets from our motherboard by unscrewing them. Once we get off, get those off, place the back plate behind the motherboard and line up your cooler with the motherboard's mounting holes, then press down evenly. This should spread the thermal paste you applied earlier. Tighten the screws a little at a time in an X shape, starting with one corner, then move to the opposite corner, then an adjacent corner, and then the last corner. You don't want to screw it too tight, it just needs to sit firm against the processor. Take the fan cable and plug it into a fan header nearby, ideally labeled CPU, or CPU fan, or CPU fan 1, or something like that. 
then route the cable as you see fit. Now go to your case and open it up. If there are no pre-installed standoffs, you'll have to install them yourself. Most cases will show you where the standoffs need to go for their respective motherboard form factors either in the manual or embossed in the case itself. Worst case scenario, you'll just have to line up the holes in the motherboard with the case and figure it out like a caveman. If you didn't do it earlier, go install your IO shield now. Motherboards are built fairly strong, so you can pick up your package by the heatsink and lower into the case, lining up the rear I.O. with the shield you definitely didn't forget to install and the standoffs. Find the standoff screws that came with your case and make sure you screw every standoff hole in the motherboard. Again, these don't need to be that tight, they just need to make good contact. Once you've got the board in, go ahead and mount your hard drives and or SSDs. Mounting will vary case by case, literally, but you'll have your manual at your disposal if you're not sure how it goes. Next, route and connect your case's I.O. cables to the motherboard. Audio cable is usually located at the bottom left of the board. USB 2.0 headers normally populate the bottom middle to bottom right areas, and USB 3.0 cables are either towards the bottom or near the 24-pin power cable or SATA ports. These cables only go in one way, so you'll just want to match the pins or make sure the keys are aligned properly. Those tiny cables like power, reset, and LEDs are sometimes labeled on the board itself, but if you're not sure, it'll be in the motherboard manual as well. Power and reset cables don't care about power and ground orientation, but you'll want to make sure any LED cables are matched power to power and ground to ground. Power is usually labeled with a plus sign, a marker, or a wire that isn't consistent with other wired colors. Next, I usually install the fans. They should have come with these relatively fat screws. Figure out how you want your fans oriented and install them accordingly. As a quick crash course, neutral pressure means that air going in equals air going out. Negative pressure means that fans are pushing more air out and therefore more air is getting sucked in through areas of the case that may not be filtered. And positive pressure is the opposite. More fans are pulling air in and air will be escaping through those openings instead, which helps prevent dust buildup inside of the chassis. I usually go for positive pressure, so assuming all else equal, I like to have more fans as intake than exhaust. This can be tweaked with fan curves and different fan styles, but that's another topic for another time. Either 3-pin or 4-pin fan cables can connect to your 4-pin headers on your motherboard, so route those accordingly. The cable heads are keyed, so they'll only fit one way. If you have a modular power supply, now would be a good time to connect the cables you'll need, like the 24-pin motherboard cable, 8-pin CPU power cable, SATA and or Molex power cables, and PCIe slash VGA cables for your graphics card or cards. Install your power supply and route the cables accordingly. In most cases, I install the power supply with the fan facing down, since the power supply mount is typically on the bottom of the chassis. This will draw air in from the bottom of the case and exhaust it through the rear. The only time I'd recommend installing it the other way around is if you plan on keeping your computer on the floor where a carpet could suffocate the power supply's intake. For the Inwin 301 case, there's really only one good orientation for the power supply since the top has no exhaust or intake holes. The CPU cable, typically marked on the power supply or the cable connector itself, will need to travel to the top of the motherboard. The 24-pin cable will need to go to the board's right side. Graphics card installation should be saved for last, but now would be a good time to route its power cables. Grab the PCIe cables necessary to feed your card and route them through either the basement shroud or the middle to bottom cable grommets, if applicable. Most cards take six or eight pin cables and sometimes even multiples of each or both or neither. If you see a cable with eight pins in total with two hanging off the side, it'll work for either. Just leave the two outliers unplugged for six pin connections. Cables that split into two heads are also fine to use. Next, connect your SATA or Molex power cables to applicable devices like drives, fans, etc. Now would also be a good time to connect your SATA data cables from your storage drives to your motherboard SATA ports, typically located on the board's right. The small form factor Dagger 600W power supply featuring the lovely 80 plus gold badge and super legit premium components from FSP that I have here isn't necessarily required for this build, but some smaller cases won't actually have the room to accommodate a standard ATX one. FSP does include an adapter bracket, just in case, though. And while not mission critical for this build, a smaller form factor does allow me to shove more cables up top, making this mess much easier to deal with. Plus, they use these flat black cables, so there's a good chance that your aesthetic will remain unadulterated. If you installed an M.2 drive earlier, you may want to refer to your motherboard manual. Some M.2 ports share bandwidth with some of the SATA ports, so you'll want to make sure those are spread out appropriately. We are almost done. You'll need to remove the expansion cover that is directly next to your top PCIe slot. Depending on the size of your card, you may also need to remove the next one down. Go ahead and make sure the clip on your top PCI slot is undone. You'll have to either push it back or slide it to the right. Next, gently but firmly insert your girthy manhood. If you push the clip back earlier, it should pop back in automatically. If you had to slide it out, don't forget to revert it back to its original position. Plug the PCI power cables you routed earlier into the card if applicable. 
All cables mentioned only fit one way, so if it's taking some considerable force, check to make sure everything's matching up. In general, I find that the 24-pin cable yields the most resistance, so that may require a little more persuasion. The PCIe 24-pin and 8-pin power cables lock in with a clip, so make sure that lines up with the edge on the motherboard's or graphics card's port. All other cables slot in like a nice key. Except for Molex. Those cables come straight from hell. Once you've plugged all you need, grab the appropriate screws that came with your case and secure the graphics card where the expansion slot covers were previously. Don't forget to remove the little inserts that protect the graphics card's ports, then hook up your monitor to one of the card's outputs, and flip the switch on the back of the power supply to the on position. And as an optional last step, if you don't want to get bullied, throw in RGB. Everything. Fans, LED strips, GPUs, coolers, RAM, motherboards, mice, whatever. You can check out this video up top for a bit more enlightenment in the topic. Once that's done and dusted, all that's left is to connect your peripherals, make sure everything runs as it should, install Windows, and be awesome. If you run into any issues when first booting up, make sure the switch behind your power supply is flipped to the 1, or the I, or the L, or the stick, or just not the circle. Check that your RAM is properly seated and that your cables are properly connected. And if all else fails, there is always the Google. Custom computers can have hundreds upon hundreds of configurations, so I can almost guarantee I disappointed at least two of you. If I've missed something, feel free to let me know or toss it in the comment section down below. Leave me questions if you've got them. Thanks for watching. My name is Steven, and I am a little dim. Bye bye. I think I'm losing my voice. Just a little bit. That'd be bad. For those of you who consider yourselves familiar and well versed with PC hardware, this video will probably. Pr pro probably. I was checking to make sure my pockets weren't like those ones that kind of flip over and cover because they those tend to like wrinkle and then point upwards and then I look at it back in the video and it really aggravates me for some reason. Although now that just this sure has a stain on it. I think. I can't tell if it's just uneven coloring or if it's a stain. Which I guess technically is the same thing, but uh I don't feel like changing it. I did not change shirt to see if you were paying attention. I changed shirt because something went wrong with the audio recording and I'm far too lazy to go look for the other shirt. So I need to do something about this light. It's really distracting. Most of the time, the clips will clip like and clip, clip, bleh, assuming your case has a cutout on the motherboard tray to allow for easy access in the back. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> then bridge the positive and negative power pins with a screwdriver. Head. Oh. Now would be a good time to connect. Now would also be an appropriate time to connect your SATA to data cables, <laughs> but some smaller cases won't actually have a room. The room, the room, the room is on fire. It's really hot. FSP does include an adapter, an ad ad adapt adapter bracket, except for Molex. Those cables come straight from hell. If you laughed, you know it's true.